All right, well, let's, let's begin. Let me do this tonight real quickly, just, um, just for planning purposes. Um, with the handouts I gave you, if you'll look on the back, I'm going to do the beginning. Um, let me do the end as the beginning. Just want to go over this, this schedule just as a reminder going forward. Uh, these are the planned remaining sessions and the dates that they're going to be on. So if you don't have those in your calendar, if you can mark those. And just note that the next one on the 16th, that's also a Tuesday, but the others are Mondays. No. Yeah. Um, also, for next, next week, um, we're going to do a couple things. I'll talk about one of them as we go through the stuff tonight. But for the reading portions, if you will do this, if you'll read Part 2, Chapter 5 in The Shepherd Leader. Uh, the Shepherd Leader is the, the blue and yellow there. Hopefully did Part 1 already, so that was Chapters 1 through 4. Um, Chapter 5 is the only one you'll need for the next one. It's pretty, pretty brief. And then in biblical eldership, which is Ian's favorite, uh, the thick one, if you'll do chapters 8 and 9 in that one. And then uh, in gospel eldership, that's the, the, the thinner one with the assignments, the discussion questions, if you'll do uh, lesson 5 in that one. And the format that we're doing, just as a reminder, we're talking about three primary uh, categories. Um, the character of an elder, the content that an elder must know, possess, guard, and then competencies. We'll talk about, you know, break it down in three. So our last, our last section of classes are going to be on, on elder competencies. And hopefully by the time you finish that one, by the time we all finish that one together, every one of us in the room would be able to have a good and succinct answer when people ask, well, what do, what do elders do? What do, what do elders do? What are elders going to do? Because we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the functions, the practical functions of eldering. It's not exactly a word, but that's what, that's what we'll talk about. Okay? All right. Well, let's pray. Let's pray, and we will we'll dive in tonight. Father, it is a, it's a humbling thing um, to be doing this tonight from my perspective, to be uh, training to be part of a training process it's, it's a humbling thing of which I feel um, inadequate for uh, father I suppose in this room are men who feel inadequate for the potential task of eldering um, and yet here we are and and we come in that humility hungry hungry to to know you and to know your will and to know specifically in this context what do you want from us right now in this season for this church for these people for this congregation Father, the elders that will be chosen, um, ideally, Father, if we're listening to you, will be the elders that you have chosen for us, among us. Um, they will be called to a specific place, not to be elders in general um, or in theory, but to specific ministry here. And so, Father, I pray that we would be wise as we learn and as we talk and as we study and as we think and as we sharpen one another what you'd have us to do here. What is the need now? What is the need of our people? What is the need of our community? Um, what sort of church are we going to be and the role that these men would play in it um, is just also critical. Um, so Father, I, I pray that um, it would settle on us the seriousness of the, of the event, um, but also, Father, that um, in gratitude we thank you for the opportunity to do what we do or whatever you call us to do in humble service, whatever you want us to do, wherever you want to use us, do that. Uh, Father, make our time, I, I pray, beneficial for all of us. And for your glory, we pray that. And for the sake of those who need shepherd leaders, uh, we pray that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're still on the subject of doctrine. And what I want to talk about today is, um, you know, doctrine is such a huge, huge issue. And unfortunately, in, in nine sessions, we couldn't begin to do justice with even a handful of, of critical doctrines. Even on a, on a level not as deep as elders would need to go, we spent, we spent two semesters, as it were, on Wednesday nights going through, um, I don't even remember the total number of doctrines, 36, 38 do different Bible doctrines, um, all important. And so you just have to know going in, as we said, we're not starting from scratch covering every possible doctrine, but we're talking about the importance of doctrine and being able to differentiate levels of doctrine and, and why we do those. I want to uh, point your attention to uh, a couple of critical verses here. 
Um, one you already know, which we looked at before. In fact, how about somebody, I didn't put this in the top of your notes. Someone open your Bible to Titus 1.9. It's a verse we looked at uh, a few weeks back. Titus 1.9. And Titus 1.9 is actually the, uh, the verse that I derive our study theme from tonight. I'm going to read that aloud, Titus 1.9. Okay, if I get that, if I have a different version, somebody read a different version, same. So remember, we talked about these themes, and, and I want to just kind of reemphasize those as a short review. One of the most critical responsibilities of elders, um, I, I, I don't want to rank the responsibilities, but without this one, without this one faithfully done, the others suffer badly, and the church suffers badly. If we don't have a, a clear sense of doctrines that must be gripped, doctrines that must be held firmly, um, then we are going to weaken the very work of the church. We're going to weaken the people in the church. We're going to uh, subject them to the spiritual harm um, if we don't do that. So we're talking about those doctrines that have to be held firmly. These are not things that are debatable. We don't hold these with an open hand. These are not up for debate. What are the things we must hold? Because there's, there's a positive side to this, we have to be able to teach these things clearly and so they're understood. What do these things mean? What are these critical doctrines? How do people know them and understand them? But at the same time, we've got to be aware enough and willing enough to refute contradictory teaching, contradictory doctrine. We've got to know it enough so that we're able to teach it clearly and well and willing enough to confront where it's not taught correctly. And that is, that's so critical. And just know this going in, I'm just sort of editorializing for a minute, that is a very unpopular notion in, in modern church today. That's just not the, the norm. That's not the flow of church culture today. The flow of church culture today is leave most, as much as possible open-handed to not focus on doctrine. Let's focus on practical life skills. Let's uh, focus on personal uh, edification kind of things. And as we're doing so, we're moving farther and farther and farther and farther away from biblical norms. We're moving farther and farther away from a right understanding of God or salvation or the truth. And so that's, that's what's really critical. Now let me read the second passage of Scripture. This is 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 1 through 3 and 6. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Now that's the specific application of the principle that's established at the beginning. The principle is this. The farther away we get from the time of the apostles, the greater the tendency there is for people to stray from the foundations of the truth. The truth was given. The, truth, the scriptures were canonized in the first century. The farther we get away from that, the tendency is to get farther and farther away from the truth. Now, this is just one example, whether it's food sacrifice to idols, marriage issues. It's been a wealth of issues. But we know that people are going to stray from the faith. Now, if you put these things before the brothers... You'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you followed. So here's the reality that we face. The reality that we face is the norm is drift, drifting away from. The norm is deviation from the truth. And our responsibility is to redirect and to bring back and to be good stewards of the truth and good servants of God by bringing forth the truth. And note, um, note the seriousness of the issue. When, when Paul talked to Timothy about the challenge of pastoring or eldering, being an elder in a church, look at how spiritual he presented everything. This is not simply an academic exercise. This is not just simply uh, people debating and discussing doctrines and theologies. This is not a cold classroom sort of setting. This was intensely spiritual and pastoral. He says, who's behind this? Who's behind the false teaching? Whether it's slight deviations or major deviations, who's behind this? Satan is behind that. Satan is the, is the great deceiver. He's a great counterfeiter. He's the great substitutor of biblical truth. He is behind that. And so 
good elders have to recognize the deeply spiritual nature of doctrine and its importance. Satan is behind all false doctrine, whether those deviations are minor or significant. He is, he's behind all those, and so we have to, we have to approach it that way. Um, I read something that Tim Chalice wrote about the importance of doctrine. I'm going to do this just real quickly. You can write now as much as you want. I'll you a few blanks to fill in, but not much else. But if you want to put some thoughts on this. I do. Six great reasons to study doctrine, and, and you can put a subtitle on this. Why, are, why does our church need us to do this? Why do we need to do this, and why do, why do we need to lead the church in this? The first one is this. He says, doctrine leads to love. And of course, primarily, it's love for God. 1 John 4, 8, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. To know God is to know love. To know God is to equip yourself to act in love. Your love for God is limited by your knowledge of Him, so you can really only love Him to the extent that you know Him. That's one of the themes that we had in our doctrine study on Wednesday nights. Doxology, I mean, theology is for doxology and devotion, G.I. Packer said. Doxology is worship. Devotion is affection, obviously. That's why we do theology. As the depth of your knowledge grows, so does your depth of love for God. You can only love a God that you know. and So that's why we, we study doctrine. When you know doctrine... It shows up in all aspects of your life. Number two, doctrine leads to humility. And this is kind of interesting. I don't want to go off on too many tangents or diatribes. But some of the most popular and simultaneously most unbiblical pastor, teacher, leaders in churches in America today have not ironically both poor doctrine and little to no humility. Human teaching, thoughts of man leads to pride. It leads to self-exaltation. Knowledge of God leads to humility. The more you see yourself in the light of who God is, the vastness of God, the greatness of God, you can't but be humbled by this. And so you, you approach this with, with humility. You know, sometimes uh, those who would argue against the importance of doctrine would say, well, doesn't Scripture say knowledge puffs up? Well, it depends on what sort of knowledge you're talking about. You know, we're talking about worldly knowledge. We're talking about my sense of what I know, well, it can, wrongly applied. But when we begin to study God and the vastness of God, um, we can't help but be humbled by it. Chalice said this, he said, a little while ago I saw a YouTube video of a man breaking the world record in deadlifting by lifting a nearly unbelievable 1,015 pounds. I know that if I tried to lift even a fraction of that amount, I'd slip a disc and be in bed for a month. The distance between that person and myself makes me face my own weakness, and that's just a glimpse of what it's like when God shows us his strength. This idea. Number, th- number three, doctrine leads to obedience. Just like you can only love God as far as you know Him, you only obey God as far as you, as far as you know Him. Um, a proper understanding of God and a fear of God, a healthy fear of God, a reverential fear of God, is so necessary for obedience. Um, think here of the Old Testament, how often God reminds the Israelites of who He is. He does this again and again. Here is who I am, here's what I've done, and therefore... You obey me. This is who I am. This is, this is what I've done for you. Um, I love this statement that he has. Theology is not a cold pursuit of facts, but a red hot pursuit of the living God. That's good. Uh, number four, doctrine leads to unity. Now, I've heard pastors and leaders say, well, no, doctrine divides. We don't focus on doctrine because doctrine divides. And I guess superficially that can be the case, but that is almost always the case where doctrine is not taught. Where doctrine is not taught, it does become a divisive issue. Because when the truth of Scripture is not held up, when it's not said, this is the word of the Lord, thus says the Lord, then of course you're going to have divisive doctrines because everyone is going to be pitting their own opinions and ideas and philosophies against everyone else's. Um, but when Scripture is rightly taught, and we'll talk about how to rightly teach Scripture, that's really going to be our theme for next week, but um, that creates unity. Churches are held together by the beliefs that they share. Um, that's, that's, that's a unifying factor. And there's always going to be variances. We talked about those. But remember what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 about the responsibility of church leaders to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So just think, you know, he draws a clear connection between doctrine 
and unity. Spiritual growth and unity. As you're growing up into Christ, as you're developing into maturity, spiritual maturity, mature manhood, as he says, you're not tossed about by every doctrine. Um, you're not caught off guard by the latest teaching or something that just sounds compelling. You, you know how to filter those things. We're going to talk about some of that in some practical aspects in a minute. Doctrine leads to worship. Again, that's something J.I. Packer emphasized. The more you're amazed with the wonders of God, and the more you're not only able to worship, it's not just about able, the more you're motivated to worship. It's a, it's a changing of the heart to worship. Uh, the more you're going to want to worship, um, the warmer the heart is. Paul says in Romans eleven thirty three, 33, quoting Psalms, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable his ways. You know, the wonder of God. And finally, for our sake, what's really most critical for us is doctrine leads to safety. It protects the church. It's the verse that we read, Titus 1. An elder has to hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So when you know doctrine, you're able to rebuke those who wander and you're responsible to. When you know doctrine, you're able to defend your church from people who try to lead it astray within or without. Um, when you know doctrine, um, you're able to teach people well and they're able to grow. You're giving them the, you're giving them the building bo- blocks to, to genuinely grow. Hey, Chuck, glad you could make it. Before we finish up tonight, let's, we want to have a special word of prayer with Chuck regarding Laney, his granddaughter. So folks were just asking about Laney before you got in, Chuck, so we're glad you could be here tonight. Now remember, we talked about, in, in terms of the seriousness of doctrine, I just want to point this out, not to rehash and just to recover ground we've gone over, but it is important for us to have this clear distinction in our mind, those different levels or layers of doctrine. Remember we talked about this? It's been, it's been a little while, so let me review. It's been, it was last month. Remember we talked about there are some doctrines that are essential for salvation, right? These are, these are gospel essential doctrines. If you remove this, you're removing the heart of the gospel. Um, if, if you take this out, what they believe is no longer able to save. It's no longer what the Bible says about, about the gospel. Um, somebody in our, in our congregation sent me a very fascinating article, very long. It took me a little while to read. I got it the other night, and I was just sitting on the couch reading it. Um, talking about the influence of a certain uh, religious leader during, uh, uh, well, Charles Finney, and Charles Finney's influence in American religious life and culture and the cycle of influence that passed down and how really the short version of doctrine is we have so much to blame on Finney for where we are today because of taking key components out. And we, we stop preaching a full gospel of the majesty of God, the seriousness of sin, uh, God's wrath and judgment, our surrender and submission, we begin just simply preaching conversion, just conversion. We want people to convert. Um, we don't want, we're not preaching the whole gospel. Then we've got essential for the health of the church, right? Remember we said this is like a spectrum. The closer you get to number one, the gospel ones, the more serious they are, but there's a spectrum of health issues. Getting these doctrines wrong doesn't put someone outside the kingdom. Like, for example, um, the doctrine of Jesus, Christology, separates... What we believe about Jesus separates us from Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons. So if someone asks me if I ever in one of those unfortunate situations where say I'm interviewed and I'm on television and someone says, well, do you, don't you believe that Mormons are, are Christians with you? I'm going to have to say no, and here's why. Because I believe their understanding of Christ is so different from the gospel that we are not kingdom partners. We don't believe the same thing about salvation. That puts you outside the kingdom of God. And yet, somebody may ask me, well, what about, you know, down at the um, International Healing and Deliverance Center for All Nations, Church of God by Faith in Christ, Full Gospel, Holy Assembly Temple, (laughs) you know, they believe such and such. Are they Christians too? And I would say, you know, if they believe this about Jesus, I would say yes, but these teachings are not. And so, you know, for the health of the church. um, And then you've got doctrines that are essential for the practice of the church. That's functional unity, right? Functional unity. Here's why we don't do that. Here, here's why we don't practice that. And here's why we don't believe that. Um, you know, the practical considerations of how we get together and do that. And then you've got non-essential doctrines. And you've, you've just honestly got some things that um, the Bible teaches on the subject, um, but the differences sometimes um, can exist among people who are like-minded in almost every other area. And they can't settle on these issues exactly what, what that's like. And, 
what that means. They're not essential to the church. And in the context of elders, you should have people being able to function together um, and maybe have some fun discussions, even some heated ones on those things. But in the end, you say, you know, this, is, this doesn't separate brothers, those kind of issues. So let's do a quick review of what, kind of what we've talked about so far, and then we're going to do something a little more interesting and challenging. Okay. All right. Here's what a good elder has to do with doctrine. And again, this is a summary. We don't have time to talk about all the doctrines um, that, are, that are essential. But a good elder's got to do these things. A good elder's got to treat theological doctrinal issues as pastoral issues, not academic ones. That's been a fault of church, I think, is we've, we've, we've failed to really understand what Paul was saying to Timothy. You know, what Paul was telling Timothy was, this is so serious. In fact, false teaching is, is so demonic that it is the means through which Satan destroys churches. Now, obviously, it's not the only means. He can destroy churches through immorality. He can destroy churches through, you know, there are other ways. But the primary way is through false teaching. He, he's a deceiver. And, of course, you know this. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. It goes back to the strategy revealed by the enemy in the garden in, in Genesis chapter 3. Did God really say? Is that really what God said? Let's take a look at that again. God didn't really say that, did he? Now, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that's the essence of what Satan does, and it's what he's always done. So we have to treat this as pastoral issues. As elders, shepherding, pastoring, leading people, those teachings absolutely matter. They, ha they have impact across the board. Again, think of them as the foundation stones. Um, the Bible says the work we do is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. These teachings, as you saw in Titus, he's got to hold firm to what? The teachings, the things he's been taught. These things that go all the way back to Christ and to the apostles. You've got to hold on to these things because true faith, true Christianity is built on that. And if you treat those just as academic matters, things that are just, you know, I mean, let me make this as practical as I can. When you deal with people who will often say things like this, well, that sort of stuff just doesn't matter to me. I'm, just, I'm not interested in, in, in doctrine. That's too hard. That's too difficult. That's too deep. You have to treat that not just simply as an academic debate. Now, you know, if I were talking to some of you about your jobs, your occupations, and I'm talking to you about engineering, or I'm talking to you about avionics, or I'm talking to you about medicine, or steel, or electricity, or whatever it may be, at some point I'm going to say, whoa, 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 too much information. That's too deep, you know. Just, just tell me if I plug this in, is it going to work? If I take this pill, am I going to feel But You know what I'm saying? That's fine for every other field. But this we can't just beg off and say, you know, it doesn't matter. It does matter because it goes right to the core of who we are. That's the essence even of the Great Commission. Teach them. Teach them. They've, they've got to learn these things. So that's first. Treat it as a pastoral issue. Number two, a good elder, this is where it starts to get real personal, a good elder's got to be aware of where and what the theological errors are in the people that he leads. Now I can't tell you exactly at this stage how we're going to ultimately and finally flesh out the practical aspects of elder ministry when it comes to personal care of individuals. But one of the things you know is a big picture issue as you've read through the elder training is this. No one single pastor can provide for the spiritual needs of seven, eight hundred, nine hundred, a thousand people. It is absolutely cannot be done. Now we ask our life group leaders to provide spiritual care, and some do in some better ways, and, and some don't do in some ways. Um, but that's the role they play too. But functionally, elders, we have to know the people that we're, we're shepherding. And we've got to know, where are those errors? What, what are they believing? You know, I was sharing with... Uh, I don't know, one of the guys on staff, I can't remember, uh, the other day, I, you know, I was on the one hand encouraged by the social media posts of people starting the new year with their Bibles laid out or their devotional book that, that they've laid out or their commitment to read that's laid out in front of them. But at the same time, I was a little bit discouraged by some folks who are members here by what they laid out in front of them. Can't wait to get started in this. And it's a book that I'll go, oh, no, not that one. Don't read that. And I want to start, you know, running a list, read this, not that kind of sort of thing. And and uh, anyway, um, we got to know. We got to know where those issues are. Number, th number three, we got to know who is influencing our people. Now, think about this for a moment. I want to try to make sort of a contextualization of Scripture. I want to contextualize a, a command that, that Paul gave to Timothy. So, Paul's talking to Timothy, you know, and all of 1 and 2 Timothy is just, just filled with warnings and challenges about false teachers, right? It's just, it's all in there. That's obviously a challenge. And Paul's even getting specific. Like even the passage we said, you know, this, this food, these idols, these things, it's very specific, it's very contextualized. 
Now, that implies to me that though it is not of prime importance, it's still important that we know something of the teaching that's out there. Does that make sense? Um, obviously, the most important thing for us is that we know the Word. Uh, we don't have to be scholars in Judaism and Mormonism and you know, every other ism there is. But we've got to know something of the situation and culture that our folks are being influenced by every day um, in order to be able to address it. You know, Paul is talking to Timothy about very specific issues. They're going to come in and they're going to teach you this. They're going to come in and they're going to try to convince your people to do this. They're going to come and talk about this. So you've got to understand the this so you can refute it. And again, I'm not saying that you have to become an expert on every bad teacher because that would be a never-ending task. But we've got to know who, who is influencing our people. And I'll just give you an example. I don't go in there a lot just because I get most of the books I get from online. Um, but I was passing some time the other day. Cecilia was in um, TJ Maxx, and so I went over to Lifeway. And so I'm just walking through Lifeway, and, and I kind of felt like, you know, I wish it was almost like a reality TV series. I, I, now I want to do this with the television crew. So I, I want to do Lifeway, undercover pastor at Lifeway. And so what I really was kind of trying to do is I'm just kind of like walking through. I was looking at this and kind of like leaning in and listening to people talk. And what I wanted to do over and over again is people were getting a book is I wanted to reach my hand over their shoulder and push it back in. Not Sarah Young. Don't get Jesus Calling or the 17 iteration of Jesus Calling. Here, here's a section of some dusty old uh, paperbacks of people you've never heard of. Read this one. All right, here's a guy. His name is Tozer. Read that and hear God speak to you. Um, you know, it, but it's those kind of things. And realizing that we've got a lot of people influenced by these. You're going to more easily find a book by T.D. Jakes than you are A.W. Pink at a Lifeway store. You're going to more likely find uh, Sarah Young than you are uh, James Broadus at a Lifeway store or Charles Spurgeon. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's, we got to know where, where are people getting these things. And then number four, you got to have the courage to identify it and call it out. Not in a jerk-like way, but in an honest way. Um, you know, just, just, to call, just, just to call these things out. You, you've got to be able to call these out. We had an event um, a couple of years ago where our students were invited to be part of a, a community student event. And um, another church had put it on, invited church to come do it, something big out in the field. And, and uh, one of the things the leader did was have them go through a prayer tunnel using words like tunnel of fire, firefall, blah, blah, blah. Well, as soon as I heard this, and you know, my daughter's come back talking about this, you know, all of a sudden I got like red flags going off like fireworks on the 4th of July. And, you know, I'm, I'm aware of the great influence that Bethel Church in Reading, Pennsylvania has on so many churches and all the faults and, and, and pseudo-Christian, even demonic practices I think that they do and, and people employ. And, and some of it was with even Hindu influence and all these things. And so, you know, my first thought was, man, i got to get to the bottom of this. So I called the guy who led it. And, and anyway, we ended up talking, having lunch, and he was a lay person, worked in the car business, and, and short version of it, he was doing stuff that he'd seen done. Didn't know, didn't have a the theological base, didn't have an understanding of it, didn't understand the dangers of it, didn't understand the teachings behind it, didn't understand the philosophy of it. And what I'm saying is we have to be willing, and that's an easy example, but we have to be willing to do this even to people in our own congregation. And we got to, that's, that's shepherding, that's good shepherding. Um, that's good spiritual parenting. Think of Paul um, as a spiritual parent to the people, fathering, mothering, till Christ is formed in you. I'm in labors of the pains of childbirth till Christ be formed in you. We just have to be willing to do that. And so I say all that to say, as elders, this is not a task that you should aspire to or desire to take on if you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to have some hard conversations with people sometimes, if you're not willing to sit down in love because you care about them. It's a pastoral concern. It's not, it's not an academic concern. I don't read that guy. That guy's an idiot. Don't read that guy. He's not right. It's not like a formula. It's a heart for them to know better and then to show them the other way, to show them something different and help people understand. And that, uh, that new apostolic reformation of which Bill Johnson from Bethel Church is a leader in and others, it has influences. That's not something far away on the other side of the country. That has influences here and not just in the international Healing and Deliverance Center, Church of God in Christ, it, in churches like ours, it's having influence. That new apostolic revelation, uh, reformation. We'll talk about Bible stuff too, actually, next week on that, so that's a good point. I want to come back to that. 
um, Bible translations. And then the last point is we've, we've really got to pray. This is a matter of prayer. Um, as we get to the functions of elders, one of the things we're going to talk about is the function of elders to pray. Um, my experience in a church with elders, honestly, is rather limited because um, we've gone through the process of putting elders in in my previous church, but it only happened in the last uh, three years or so that I was there as pastor, so I only got to enjoy this for about three years. But one of the primary functions that, that we had, I'm, I'm going to say functions, one of the primary activities that we did was prayer. I mean, the, the, pray, the praying that we did uh, for the people and praying that they would be sanctified by the truth, praying that they, their lives would be changed. So uh, prayer, was a, prayer was a huge, huge function of that. Did I leave one out? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, I skipped notes. Oh, yes, that's the one. This is what we're going to talk about next week, by the way. So thank you. Good segue. Good elders. This is, this is so critical that we're going to spend a whole session on this, and I, and I hope it won't be redundant for some of you, but I hope it will be helpful for everybody. A good elder has got to know the, ba- the principles of basic biblical hermeneutics. And if you're not even familiar with the word hermeneutics, what I'm basically talking about is the, the skill or the art of opening and understanding Scripture, of translating, not translating, you have a translation, of just understanding Scripture. How do we study the Bible? What are the basic biblical hermeneutics? Um, because here's what you're going to find. The basic, the, the basic hermeneutic that the majority of Christians today operate under is, here's what this means to me, or here's how this makes me feel. It's some variation of that. The, here's what I think. Okay. Well, an elder's got to be able to know, when I open the Bible, what am I doing with the text that I've got? Where, where do I start? How do I begin to break this down? How do I understand it? And not in ways that require a seminary education, but in simple ways, the simple tools that any Christian can possess. How do you open the Bible and read it, read it for yourself? How do you do this? You know, how, how can you help someone? If you're mentoring someone or coaching someone, discipling someone, um, or just simply talking with someone who is reading a scripture and their understanding of it's way, way out here in left field, how do you show them, look, when you read this, here's, here's the starting point. Here's this, this is basic hermeneutics. Now, we don't have to use that terminology. We're not trying to freak everybody out or impress people with our knowledge. Just here, here's the basic approach to scripture. Here's a, here's a good, solid hermeneutic. And all of us have to have that, by the way. If you've got... Say you've got uh, five elders in a room sitting around a table, and we're discussing an issue now that's suddenly become of of significance to us at Calvary. Um, This is an issue that now we need to give a biblical response to, right? So, you know, just throw something out there. You've got um, got one of our life groups. It's one of our larger life groups, and it functions more like a small church, and you've got, you know, a teacher and just a lot of people listening to the teaching, and the teaching that he's giving is not correct, or he's introduced something there that is, you know, well, now we need to give a statement. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach about the role of women in the church or ministry or speaking in tongues or, you know, the list just goes on and on and on. And the elders, if we are sitting around the table, you've got five or six people discussing this issue, and of course our basis is not what do you think, what do you feel, what effect do you think it'll have, what do you think everybody's going to like? We don't start there, right? We say, well, what does the Word say? and we've got five different approaches to the word, it's like coming up to an intersection with seven different entry points and exit points, and everybody's just swirling. It's like driving in, in India or Port-au-Prince. You know? We can't do it that way. We've got to have a common approach to Scripture that says, all right, let's break this down. Let's look. Let's, let's, let's have a good hermeneutic and be able to share it. So that's the one. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that next week. All right, let's do this tonight um, in the little bit of time we have left. And I know this is going to be a challenge. And um, in a way, it's a bit unfair. But the reason I'm doing this to you tonight, or for you, is because this is the reality. This is nuts and bolts of applied doctrine when it comes to elders. Um, The names have been removed to protect the innocent or the ignorant here, and the situations have been altered some, but all of these things are real, okay? And so what I want you to do is is I want you to get in groups of, you know, maybe about three, so it's not so much pressure of just a one-on-one thing. So if you can kind of get in a little group of three or pull yourself away or maybe come around the other side of the table because I don't want to try to do these with all 20 of us at one time. I've given you some case studies, okay? In fact, what I want us to do tonight is in short order, I want us to discuss these in those little triads of people 
It could be three or four, it doesn't matter. But I also want you to take these home and give a little further thought to them, particularly those that you're not satisfied with the answers that were given in your little group. We didn't come up with a good answer, or we came up with different answers. Um, because here's, here's, what, here's what we ultimately need to be able to do. We need to be able to answer these things biblically and pastorally. Does that make sense? You know, biblically is first. What, what does Scripture say? But the way we handle it, the way we respond to it, is pastorally. In other words, we're doing this as shepherds for your soul. We're doing this for your spiritual benefit. So let me just go through these. And if there's a question about them before you get in, because I don't, I don't want you to get into the process and say, that didn't make sense for me. So you've got a sincere church member who just happens to speak up in a life group, maybe says it across the room, you're talking about something, the mission, mission trip coming up or the gospel or something, and they say something like this, I believe Jesus is my way of salvation. I just can't believe he's the only way of salvation for all those people who've never heard of him. That doesn't seem fair or loving, and I know God is both. Okay, what's your response? How do you handle that? Don't answer yet. I'll do that in your groups. All right, you got a heartbroken older mom in the church. She's talking about her adult son, and you know, you're asking, hey, you know, I, have, you know, I haven't heard from James. You know, I haven't heard you mention James in a while, Billy, whatever. Uh, how's he doing? Um, she asks you to pray, or whatever. She asks you to pray for something. You say, you know, is he saved? Is he, is he a believer? Is he born again? Here's her answer. Yes. He asked Jesus into his heart when he was five, but now he wants nothing to do with church. He won't let my grandkids come to church with me, and he even made me take back the Bible I got him for Christmas. What do you tell her? How do you respond to that? Third case study. I was talking with my friend the other day. He goes to International Outreach Deliverance Center. I made that up. Um, he says... When you receive the, the blessing of the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues. Have you received the second blessing yet? What do you say? How do you answer that? And the answer is not yes or no, by the way. <laughs> Thoughts. True. Number four, a church member comes to you with concerns about some families who've left the church. People are saying they just don't like all the changes. How do you respond? You're an elder. What do you say in that situation? Or how do you handle the situation? Number five, a deacon in the church confides in you that he's very unhappy in his marriage. In fact, he's already decided to leave his wife. And this is what he says. I know God will forgive whatever I do. You're an elder. Give him spiritual leadership. What do you say to him in that situation? Number six, you developed a close relationship now with a fe fellow elder. One night in, in brokenness, he confesses to you that he struggles almost daily with pornography. I know I need to stop. What should I do? What do you say? This is your friend, this is your brother, this is an elder. How do you respond? All right, let's, let's see if you can find some space somewhere. I know we're all packed in here. See if you can find some space, no more than four people, three or four people at, at most, and let's kick those answers around for, for just a little bit, and then we're going we're gonna to wrap up with something. We can pull the table out a little bit if that helps. Let's start with number six. I got that one. T. There may be a little bit more to them. So let's just look at a couple of things real quick, and I won't, keep us, I won't keep us late tonight. So let's look at the first one. All right, you've got someone who just speaks up in a life group and just has the boldness to say, I just, I don't, I don't get that. That's not, that's not my version of God. I don't see God as fair in that way. Well, here you've got an issue that, that really goes to level one of doctrine. Um, what does it mean to be a Christian? How, are, how is anybody saved? So this one, honestly, is pretty clear cut. And, and how you address that, um, again, there are a lot of other issues. What is the essence of fairness? Who is God? You know, you've got to dig through some other issues, but it's a, it's a pretty straightforward sort of, sort of discussion. What scriptures, um, as you were discussing that, what scriptures came to mind that you would start with here? Okay. Okay, Romans 1, John 14. And even that question begs Genesis 1 and, and just the authority and person of God, sinfulness of man, um, things like that. Okay, number two is, is more nuanced. 
because you've got several issues at play here that w require skillful pastoral care. You've got someone, first of all, that has spiritual concern and hurt for their own child. So this is not an abstract. This is not someone, hey, what do you believe about this? I was reading this book by John MacArthur who said this, but Michael Brown said this, so who do you think is right? This is not an abstract debate. This is someone who's deeply concerned about their son or their daughter, or their son in this case, and in their minds, what hope they draw is that they are, in fact, saved. Now, that may, in fact, be a false hope, and I think what Scripture would encourage us to do is approach someone in that condition as if they were lost. Now, we don't know the heart. That's not our, we don't know the, the role, but we can see the fruit, and the fruit was it just lostness, so we'd approach that situation, situation with lostness. So when you kick that around and they ask you, what, what's your response to that question? Just anybody, what, what was your first thought? We've got a lot of folks come through here that have been baptized at five and six. Okay, that's good. I'm glad somebody, I'm glad you guys noticed that. She said, we pray. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's your pastoral response. Absolutely, I'll pray. Let's talk about them. Tell me about their, where they are spiritually. But you may have to also have some conversation with her about salvation. What does it mean to be a Christian? You know, what do the scriptures really teach? And you may need to begin coaching her on how she might approach that relationship differently. Um, you know, for instance, in a situation very, very similar to this, um, I've met with a lady a couple of times about how you might share the gospel with them. And here's some things that since they like to read, ask them if they'd be willing to read this. Be willing to discuss this with them. Start here. Here's some things. But I would approach this from a perspective of lostness because the evidence suggests that. So let's approach it in that, in that sense. There's some other things to consider there too, of course. Okay, you've got the question of, you've got the question of, of tongues. Um, this one in some form or another probably comes up as much or more than almost any other question it seems like. I had uh, one of our college students um, wanted to come and meet with me this week. One of his buddies, one of his roommates, um, goes to church all the time. Great guy, nice guy. Reads his Bible, good Christian guy, doesn't understand why our student doesn't speak in tongues. Um, what do you say? How do you, how do you answer that? Um, that's something that you need to have an answer for. That's something you need to have a biblical response to. What did, where did you guys go with this in your conversations, just, just briefly? Well, the way I framed it is that is the doctrinal position of, that's a, that's the, that's a Pentecostal doctrinal position, second blessing. That's standard. Um, you get saved. Later, you receive a second blessing. The mark of the second blessing is speaking in tongues. So when we say it's not practiced much, that would be in our context. Around the world, it's very practiced. What's the role of the Holy Spirit in salvation? Oh, yeah. Who, yeah. What does the Scripture say about the Holy Spirit in salvation? Um, and I would, again, I'm not going to try to give answers to each of these because that would take a long time for me too, but go back to what we talked about before in the different levels of doctrine, right? We say the level one sort of thing is this compromises the, the very gospel itself. Does that compromise the gospel? In almost every case, it probably doesn't. I mean, these people are probably born again. I mean, a, a large, it may, it may compromise what it, you know, if it comes to, you know, your evidence of salvation, is it speaking in tongues or something? It can, it can. Here's my, my concern, the reason I placed that. I was trying to put questions that hit each of these areas. Most Christians today, even Christian leaders, will put this in a third category. So a third category, whoops, I just lost my notes. You know, a third category is basically doctrinal issues based on practice. And so our response typically in that situation is, you may not say it exactly this way, but the essence is, you do that, we don't. That's not our practice. And so we've relegated it to a third level. I would suggest that in reality, that is very much at least a, a, a two-level doctrine. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. This is an issue for spiritual health. This is a pastoral issue. This is not just simply a practice issue. If you have a, a aberrant teaching on this, or what it means to worship, what it means to experience Holy Spirit, what a move of God is, you know, all these things are related to that, how God shows himself, what is a manifestation of, that becomes a, that becomes a church health issue. That's not simply okay. All right, so let's, let's continue. Um, Next, doc, uh, the next question. Um, oh, uh, church member comes to you. People are saying they just don't like all the changes. What's your response? 
Now again, I'm looking, you know, I want you to be thinking, I gave you a hint here. There are other issues at play here. Here's one of my favorite things, which you'll get to when you're in, when you get, you know, if you haven't gotten already. This is one of my favorite. People are saying. I just this just take this more as coaching than discussion. Never engage. People are saying. This was my trick question. You don't engage it. You don't engage it. Who's saying? Usually, people are saying means I'm saying to people. Okay, but the issue is this. This is where you apply scripture here. What's a scriptural approach to conflict and people's talking and people dissatisfied or offended by, or what, what's, this, what's a biblical approach? How do you take this and say, you know, not just, we're not just trying to, well, I'm sorry, I hate that, or, we well, you know, um, is there anything I can do? Or, you know, we, we have a tendency to over-pastoral with, with a sympathetic response. How do we give a biblical response? But it's also pastoral. So we take sort of a Matthew 18 approach, we're asking them to do what? Yeah, they really need to come and talk to me. They really need to come and talk to me. Now, I'd be happy to talk to you about any concerns that you have. I mean, is this, is this, are these yours? Do you share these? Does, does this come from you also? Or, you know, I mean, I'd love to talk. What, what, you know, are these concerns that you have? Um, well, they're not me. You know, it's not me. I'm not saying, I mean, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's people. I mean, you, don't, you can't engage it biblically. Right, so if you know if you guys spent like 15 minutes talking about, well, you know, there are a lot of problems. I'd help, I'd help them. We lay it all out. Don't do it. It's not it's not biblical and it's not pastoral. Um, people have to you have to deal with them personally. Encourage them to go back to those individuals. If people are bringing this to you, you need to encourage them to do the right thing. You need to encourage them to come and talk. Well, they are wondering. You know what? Ask them to do what you just did. I had a conversation with one of our church members not so long ago, sort of like this. I just left out all the details, and I said, you know. Um, the best thing you could do is those people, encourage them to do the very thing that you just did. You see how easy that was? You, you stopped by the church, you saw my door was open as it usually is, and you said, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, sure, come on in. And we talked for a long time, and you got your answers. See what I'm saying? Okay, let's move to the next. Um, number... Oh, right, no. I, I mean, for you saying what I would do, have them to come and talk to me. If, if they've got a concern, not to me, to you. Yeah. Well, if they've got a concern, have them come and talk to me. Here's my number. Or, you know, whatever. Or you tell them I'd love to talk to them. I just, I can't talk about generalities. I can't, you know, I just can't talk about what people are saying. You know, that's really not, that's not fair to me. That's not fair to the church. That's not constructive. You know, something along those lines. You, you, you challenge people to handle their, their issues in the right way. Okay. Uh, a deacon. That, this, is, this is a tough one, right? Deacon in church confides in you. He's very unhappy. He's already decided to leave his wife. He says, I know God will forgive whatever I do. What's your response to that? Again, this is, there are multiple levels here to this. What's your response to that? Yeah, there's something happening, obviously. Um, what do you do with the statement, I know God will forgive whatever I do? And if that sounds like someone, no one ever says that. I've had people say that right in that office right there. It's a good object lesson. Now that's true, elder. What? God will forgive me. Lead by example. Sorry, you guys keep talking. Uh, I get to do what I want. 
But the, what I wanted you to see in this is, the reason I ask a question like that is I want you to see that the process that you're going to have to take on as an elder is nuanced and lengthy. So occasionally you're going to get the tea, you're going to get the ball put on a stand. But sometimes you're going to get to an issue like this. Now you've got multiple issues to work through. Now you've had someone talk to you about, your, about their marriage, and you have a responsibility as a brother in Christ to talk to them biblically about marriage and their commitment and to help them in whatever way you can and to get them help in whatever way you can. You've also got a theological doctrinal issue here, someone who has a very skewed view of, of grace that this may take some time to undo and unravel. You also have a functional issue as a shepherd protector of the church. This person is a deacon. So now there's, now there's a corrective measure that has to be taken. Right? So, you know, again, um, the, the short and simple doesn't necessarily address it all. As, a, as an elder, you're looking at all of these different angles and how do, you, how do you protect the church? How do you uphold the legitimacy of the position or the office? How do you minister to a family that's hurting and a marriage that's broken? How do you teach and apply correct doctrine in that situation? You know, so it's a nuanced thing. Okay, the last one, which is probably, uh, I think, uh, probably the hardest one of all. Um, as we're looking at this, we are assuming that we're in this thing by ourselves, but we're not. And that's the beauty of it. I mean, there's a lot Yes, of that's a great point. And that, you know, it, it may be a situation where I really do feel strongly that I just need to re reach out and slap them. But that's not going to help that brother grow. So maybe I need to go to a fellow elder and let's sit down and discuss it. Help me formulate a good answer and a good mm -hmm. response and a good direction. Right. So I'm not sitting here making stupid mistakes by and maybe will you go with me? Yes. Let's go talk to them together, whatever it may be. But the last one's a little different. So, you know, you've had, you've had that person at the first question that's got a tenuous grasp on biblical doctrine of salvation, but now you're talking about an elder. You've been in the trenches with this person. You've prayed beside them. You know their wife, their kids. you work worked together with them, and there's a relationship of trust there, even encouraged accountability among elders. And they share this with you. Okay, what's your what's your response? And see, and, and this is one of those kind of situations that becomes very challenging because you have all these things at play. All right, you have a responsibility of leadership, and that person has a responsibility to the things that we've talked about, living an above reproach life. Um, of all the things, of the three things we talked about, of character and content and competency, character is first. And that goes to the core, that goes to the heart of character. So Jed's right, and that, I was wondering if that was going to come up in your discussions, well, he can't be an elder anymore. I mean, I was hoping that, that would be some faults, you know, some of you probably didn't even have a chance to get to that question yet. Um, well, he can't be an elder anymore. But at the same time, also, we also have to respond to him as a brother who's fallen. How do we minister to him? How, how, do, we, how, do, we, how do we work towards his restoration? Um, what will we do? How will we partner with? What will we challenge him to do? What will we say to him to do? You know, those kind of things. And maybe back to Chuck's point in relation to what Ian said. Ian said, send it to me. You know, Ian's been one of our leaders in our purity um, ministry, purity efforts with men and purity groups. Is This is a situation that probably does call for some other people to be involved with and some wise counsel and prayer. And you, you see what I'm saying? It's a, it hits all of these issues. And, and that's why I'm trying to say when we talk about doctrine, and I guess this is the point I want to make, I'm going to close for time's sake. We talk about doctrine, I don't want you to think of this as just cold, indifferent things, facts, concepts. Um, this is real life stuff. When we're talking about purity or we're talking about the nature of God or we're talking about the person of Christ, or this has real life implications here. How I see God has everything to do with me standing in front of someone saying, Listen, I know what I'm about to do is wrong, but I know God will forgive me. How I understand Scripture has everything to do with me saying, that just doesn't seem fair to me, so I don't believe it. Um, you know, my understanding of the role and responsibility of leadership has everything to do with, can I be an elder and be doing this simultaneously? You see what I'm saying? All of these things are interrelated, and that's sort of the functional, practical work that elders have to be, be prepared for. And I just stopped at six. I mean, there could have been there could have been a lot of others. But and again, if this is a daunting sort of thing, I don't want it to be. But those are the sort of things that we we have to be growing in and, and developing in. And ideally, the elder ministry gets stronger and healthier 
as we spur each other onto this. You deal with doctrinal issues, you deal with moral issues, you deal with practical issues. Um, so that's just all part of the, it's all part of the deal. It's all part of the package. Um, read those few chapters. There's not a lot of reading between now and next week. I, I, um, I know your time won't, time is going to be short anyway. It won't take you long to go through those. Those are, those are short. The Strzok, when I get it, it's a little, it's a little wordy. I was telling Ian before we started, when Strzok put that book together, I really feel like he put it together to be the textbook for elders. And so, so many other books about elders have referenced that back. Um, so it is a little lengthy, but I find it a little bit humorous. And I'm going to show you a short video clip next week or the week after where Strzok has a little video and he's called What is Biblical Eldership, which is the name of the book. And he basically summarizes his own book in 12 minutes. So, you know, it's kind of interesting. Like, man, you should have made this a pamphlet. This has been a lot easier for us. But um, if you look at those sections and do that part, and then uh, next week it will be our last section on doctrine per se, and we're going to talk about a biblical hermeneutic um, because the one thing that separates elder ministry biblically from deacon ministry is the ability to teach. The ability to teach I don't think necessarily requires an act of ongoing recognized position of teaching, but it does require the ability to teach. Can that person step in? Could they step into the pulpit? Could they step into a life group? Could they talk to two or three people and open up the Word and explain it to them? Um, can they help someone who's struggling? Um, I just don't get this. You know, you're, you, you got people leaving a, a Wednesday night Bible study for instance, and saying, man, I don't, I don't get that at all. And that stuff happens. I don't get that. Oh, hey, let's talk about it. I'd love to, you know, let's sit down. I'd love to go over some of these things with you. The ability to rightly handle Scripture and show people to do that. It's going to be part of, that'll be part one of what we'll do next week. So anyway, we'll meet again Tuesday next week in here, and then the rest, the, the final four will be on Mondays per that schedule. Any questions or thoughts for today?